The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son, so that your Son may glorify you, just as you gave him authority over all people, so that your Son may give eternal life to all you gave him. Now this is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. I glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. Now glorify me, Father, with you, with the glory that I had with you before the world began. I revealed your name to those whom you gave me out of the world. They belong to you and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you gave me is from you, because the words you gave to me I have given to them. And they accepted them and truly understood that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for the ones you have given me. Because they are yours, and everything of mine is yours. And everything of yours is mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I will no longer be in the world, but they are in the world, while I am coming to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As we continue our novena to St. Peregrine, we say together our novena prayer. O great St. Peregrine, you have been called the wonder worker because of the numerous miracles which you have obtained from God for those who have had recourse to you. For so many years you bore in your own flesh the debilitating disease of cancer. I seek God's healing. Help me to imitate your enduring faith in the face of my great challenge, that I may trust the Lord as you did in your time of affliction. Help me to find the strength to proclaim God's presence in my life, despite the anguish and fear this disease causes in me and my loved ones. O glorious and peregrine, Aided in this way by your powerful intercession, I will sing to God now and for all eternity a song of gratitude for his great goodness and mercy. Amen. So on September the 11th, 2001, my cousin arrived early at JFK Airport in New York. He worked for a U.S. bank in its London office and made the trip from the U.K. to the U.S.A. once every four to six weeks. So on this morning, he made his way, as usual, to the bank's offices in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. I think it was on the 84th floor. And while he was going up on the elevator, the first plane must have hit the North Tower. Because when he arrived at the reception desk, he saw through the window the smoke and damage from the first crash. And he said immediately to the receptionist that they should all leave the building at once. And she said that they had been told to stay and not to evacuate. And he says that to this day he doesn't know why he had this overwhelming impulse to get out of the building as soon as he could. So he tried to persuade the other staff members to leave, but they were determined to stay at their posts. And he left everything by the reception desk, his bag, his computer, everything, his documents, his passport. And he began to run down the stairs. So he's a marathon runner and very fit. So he emerged from the tower just after the second place the plane hit it. So he survived. He doesn't know why. The other people in that office were all amongst the 2,996 people who died on that day in New York. All were killed except him. And needless to say, the memories of such a tragedy go deep. And when he was eventually able to return home, it was the sight of his children, he says, waiting for him at the airport that moved him most. He saw how many gifts he'd received, he saw what was really important in his life, and how close he had come to losing it all, and how much he took for granted. So the intensity of loss had refined his own scale of priorities. So it's the experience of loss or the proximity of loss that causes us often to question the values which, on which we base our lives. 
causes us to shed some of the excess baggage we carry with us. The impedimenta of success and achievement, of getting and spending, of having and hoarding. Now one of the great problems in our society is loneliness and solitude. There are more people living alone in our society than at any time in the last hundred years. One of the primary causes of loneliness, or some of the primary causes of loneliness, are separation, sickness, and death. And the death of a loved one, or the diagnosis of serious illness, can precipitate bouts of more or less prolonged depression. And very often the treatment proposed is a course of antidepressants. But of course this might treat the symptom, but it doesn't treat the cause. Often, depressed people feel guilty about being depressed. It's a condition that doesn't correspond to the bright and sunny superficial optimism that reigns so confidently in parts of our world. And isolation follows, because other people often fear that depression is catching, that it can be transferred from one person to another if you're not careful. And this is what makes people who are suffering from depression often flee away from others. They feel that no one can understand and they can't explain what weighs so heavily on them. And when we're troubled or heavily burdened by some deep grief or anxiety, we search for someone who will understand. And the understanding might not involve some intellectual analysis of what weighs us down, it more usually involves somebody who will accept the burden of our hurt and confusion. Somebody who will carry it with us without necessarily understanding it. The successful sharing of the burden is accomplished when somebody accepts our pain without loading theirs onto us in exchange. Now this is the continuation of the atoning mission of Jesus Christ which is fully revealed to us as he takes up his cross after his judgment by Pilate and his rejection by his own community. So to follow Christ means to take up the cross. To take up the cross is to bear one another's burdens, but also the burdens of others. It's to break free of the spiral of hurt and violence that so often seems to hold our world in its grip. So to take up the cross is to accept responsibility for the world, for those with whom we share it, and for our own part in shaping it, is to admit that we are very much more like each other in our needs than we are in our achievements, and that if we wish to find God, it's through faithfulness and honesty and accepting the consequences of the choices we've made that we shall find him. At the Last Supper, Jesus is a dead man. His betrayer is at hand. The trap set for him is about to be sprung. And the words and actions of a dying man have a peculiar intensity and meaning. Usually the dying begin a process of taking leave before the moment of their death. Slowly but surely they start to slip away from us. They begin a process of detachment in preparation for that last journey which we must all make alone. Paradoxically, it's at this moment when they most need the companionship of others that it's often denied them. Now this isn't always callous indifference, but anxiety that confronting the situation will somehow bring about the end that we most dread. Those who love us most find it difficult to face the prospect of life without the one they love and cherish. Perhaps that love has been understated or taken for granted. Or sometimes there have been wounds and hurts in the working out of that love. And we feel regret and sorrow for what now seem to be trivial disagreements or petulance. And we panic at the thought that there will not be time to heal them all. But what happens in these situations is that one who is dying often ends up giving pastoral care to those who will survive. And they can engage in a conspiracy of denial in order to avoid pain to their loved ones who will survive them. I remember once attending a dying man and I asked his relatives if he knew that he was approaching death. Of course he knew. People often know. But he didn't wish to speak of it for their sake, not for his. 
They were insistent that he should not be told, saying to me, no father, if he knew the shock would kill him. Didn't see the contradiction. Hmm? So it's ironic that when we most need the love and prayers of those closest to us, that we are often denied them. How many times have I been called to the hospital to anoint a person who is already unconscious, having been in the hospital for some time before? His relatives have delayed calling the priest, thinking that would be a definite sign that what they feared most was coming about, the priest was the angel of death. Jesus says, if anyone would be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow me. In the last days of Holy Week, we can see Jesus entering into that experience of loneliness that can form part of our own experience of sickness and death. Now, on the night of his agony, Jesus is not detached. He is intensely present. It's rather his disciples who are absent, not there. And at times they seem willfully blind to what is going on, refusing to see Jesus' departure, for example, falling asleep later when Jesus asked them to keep watch with him. And the most puzzling feature of all is in Matthew and Mark's version of the Last Supper narrative, when Jesus foretells that one of them will betray him, and they all ask in turn, Is it I? Is it I? Well, why ask such a question if it had never crossed your mind to do it? And St. Luke adds an even stranger comment. Immediately after Jesus prophesies the betrayal of Judas and prompts them to question who it might be, Luke tells us that an argument also began between them about who should be reckoned the greatest. And that's an extremely puzzling comment. Are they already presuming that Jesus was either going to abandon his position of leadership or that it was going to be taken from him? Were they putting in their bids as to who should succeed him? As he says to them, you will all fall away. They will all abandon him out of fear. So Jesus' way of the cross is a way into isolation. If anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me or come after me. So Jesus in his passion travels a lonely road. There is none to speak for him and none to defend him. The power of God is revealed in that experience of isolation and loneliness. It's also a path of humiliation. When we're very sick, for example, we come to depend on the care and ministry of others in a way that we have not since childhood. We find that doing even the smallest things for ourselves exhausts us and exceeds our capability. We experience a form of weakness and humiliation. Our society has a desire to protect and deny its members from anything it deems unpleasant. Pain and sickness are often tidied away. As one doctor once said to me, after a funeral I just celebrated for a good friend of mine who was a famous British cardiologist who died tragically young, full of promise. He said, this is a defeat for me. It fills me with anger. All he could feel was anger, failure, impotence. But what does it mean to say along with St. Paul, death, where is thy sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death often seems to carry a powerful sting. It's a brave or foolish priest who will speak blithely about the resurrection to a mother who has just lost her child. What robs death of its triumph? When we refuse to give in to the overwhelming sense of loss that submerges hope. Our death is our greatest act of faith and hope. It's the last stage on our earthly journey. But it's not the end of the road. St. Paul tells us if we have died with him, we shall also live with him. It's the process, in the process of handing ourselves over in faith and hope to the Father that we become more conformed to the image of Christ. When Jesus calls his disciples, he summons them to a journey. He tells them to take nothing with them for the road. That experience is directly counter to what most of us do when we embark on a journey. Because the great challenge is always what to pack. What should we take with us? What should we leave behind? Well, if your experience is anything like mine, you'll probably have found that most of the things you bring with you, you didn't need and were not used. And on returning home, we find most of the paraphernalia we have carried with us, we could have done without. 
When Jesus calls his disciples to share in his journey, he invited them not to pack, but to unpack. So the journey of faith is a voyage for which you unpack rather than pack. In the process of unpacking, we decide what is truly important for us. And the whole process is a metaphor for our life. As our life draws towards its close, we are faced with the challenge of unpacking, since we know that all we've accumulated must be left behind. If the act of dying is an act of self-surrender, of deliverance into the hands of a loving father, it can only be successfully fulfilled as an act of faith. But then only if there have been many acts of self-surrender. Jesus sometimes speaks of death as sudden and unprovided. What matters is to be ready to embark on that last journey, unencumbered. At the Last Supper, Jesus says to his disciples, Fear not, little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And our task then is to be receptive to this gift that God desires to bestow on us. And the death of Jesus shows us the meaning of his life. And what we who follow him have to do is to see life as a gift, something which we've not merited and which we can't deserve. And when old age, infirmity or unprovided illness falls upon us, we're being challenged to a generosity of heart. And as possibilities contract for us, we can't hang on to what we have, families, friends, communities, learning, position, power, all that is best and most desirable, as well as what by any estimation does not matter in the end. All has to go. So these images, or these things, are not untimely ripped from us, but received as our gift from God, to whom we, were, we return them. Our passing from this life, the manner of it, is really a parable for our whole life. Letting go, letting God take over, learning to accept with a definite yes and amen. Then death has lost its sting. And what is the sting? Well, greed or covetousness. Grasping for what can't be obtained as a prize, but can only be received as a gift. What was the sin in the garden? Pride and greed. The tempter said, and you shall be as gods. And what was the charm in that promise? It was the desire to be all-powerful, to be all-knowledgeable, and to be eternal. Adam and Eve could not trust God. They could not believe in his word. They were impatient and couldn't wait for him to fulfill his promises. They couldn't say, as Jesus the second Adam said, and as we are invited to pray, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And it was in the garden that all our wandering began. I remind you that you may lay your petitions in the shrine opposite. And we join together now in our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the Church honors you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, a blessed Jew, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and evoke thy aid. Amen.